Hello everybody and welcome to what I know is going to be a very special video. Today I am celebrating five years as a YouTuber and I'm doing it in style. But it's a little bit odd for me if I'm honest because today I am merely a bit player in this video, simply a cast member, because today's production has been entirely conceived, filmed and edited by my former students at the University of Surrey in Guildford in the United Kingdom. Now we're currently only a few miles away from there in the car park of Bell and Culver, which I'm sure will be familiar to many of you that have been following the channel for quite some time. But today we're not talking about Subarus, nor are we talking about Lotus. We're talking about a car you've probably never heard of. This is something very special indeed. Let's just imagine that you're a well-heeled petrol head and you want to buy yourself something nice for the weekend and you've got about £200,000 burning a hole in your pocket. What do you buy? Well, there's a lot of choice out there. You could have a 911 Turbo S, very capable, but a little bit vanilla. You could go and get yourself a McLaren 720S, slightly used, a great car for sure, but if you do turn up at a car park meet, there is a good chance somebody else might already have one. So what then do you do? Well, I've always loved a Lotus, but ultimately at that price point, they're probably a little bit too cheap. If you've got a thing for retro cars, you could go down the kit car route, build yourself a replica GT40, an AC Cobra, but that of course brings many problems of its own. Where do you get the engine from? Where do you get the kit from? Who's going to build it? How long will it take? Will it be any good? Will it fall apart? Would you trust a car that you built yourself? And at the end of the day, what you're going to have is simply a facsimile of a much greater item. So if you want something that delivers retro thrills, but is just a little bit different to everything else out there, what could you buy? Well, wouldn't it be great if somebody out there that knew what they were doing with cars and car design had built something at that kind of price point that you've probably not even heard of? Well, such a thing does exist, and it's the brainchild of a man called Steve Nichols. If you haven't heard of him, you should have, because he's the man that designed the McLaren MP44, otherwise known as the most successful Formula One car in history. And today's car is his baby. It's called the Nichols N1A. And today's star is this, which is the prototype. Oh, and it runs. You don't really realise just how fast it is until you look in the mirror and see that the people who were behind you aren't there anymore. You've got this sort of period experience, you know, that's the way cars were uh, back then. Uh, there, there wasn't the paddle shift and those sort of thing, automatic transmissions like that. The feel that you get through the steering wheel, I mean, it's, you, you're much more connected than you are with a modern car. The, the car is very involving, you know. So it doesn't do a lot of the work for you, you have, to, you have to do it yourself. And the car is the entertainment. So let's learn a little bit more about the team behind this exciting new car. Well, I'd always been looking um, at a potential car project to do. I'd had several ideas and um, one of them was to do something from the mid 60s. And the reason for that was that that was really the turning point where up until then you could, you could realistically drive a car to a racetrack um, and then drive it back home again. And, and, and it was usable on the road. It might be slightly compromised, but it, it, it certainly wasn't a difficult thing to do. And then as time progressed through, through the 60s and, and then even more into the 70s and beyond, racing cars became more and more specialized to the point where you just couldn't do that anymore. They, they really were only at home on the racetrack. Cars were designed purely by eye back then. So it really was a case of what looked like, look right was right. Um, and the aesthetics were really important, really because they didn't understand that just as much as you were looking for an attractive and aerodynamically 
efficient shape you really wanted downforce and it was in, it was more important really to get downforce at the expense of the aerodynamic efficiency in a, in a straight line for the car. Uh, the reason for the M1A as a base was the, this is the McLaren, it, it was the very first McLaren um, and I'd known Steve Nichols who was chief designer at McLaren back in the Senna Prost era um, as a friend for a long time. We'd also worked together um, on projects as well but also I loved the shape of the original M1A and I thought that something which took the design language of that car but updated it um, could look really, really special. And so that, that was really the beginning of the project. The M1A was one of Bruce McLaren's earliest creations. Launched in 1964, it set the template for all future McLarens by achieving performance through lightweight and clever engineering. Woking themselves have recently released their own modern take on this car, and they called it the Elva. It costs £1.5 million and draws heavily on their existing road car catalogue and technology. Nichols have trod a very different path. My, f my first job in Formula One was, was with McLaren, and uh, I worked there for something like 15 years. And, but we haven't tried to just build a replica car or a continuation car or anything like that. It's, this car is quite different. This is quite a simple car and concentrates on just pure performance and kind of old school performance. You know, there's still an H pattern gear shift and not a lot of electronics. And, and so it appeals in the same way that the aesthetics are based in a, in a retro sort of sense. Uh, also, the, the performance is like that. Uh, you have to drive the car yourself. You have to shift the gears yourself. It doesn't have a lot of electronic aids, you know, and, and I think it appeals to those people who like that level of involvement with the car where you drive the car rather than the car doing it uh, for you. The things that are the biggest differences, I suppose, are that we're a lot more aggressive looking. Uh, the, the M1A was quite a dainty car. Uh, if, if there was one here next to this one, I think any, everybody would be surprised just how small it was. So we're about um, 180 mil wider. Um, and most of it is in the haunches and the front wings. So it, it does look more butch. And then there's an awful lot of detail design work that's gone into it, so that no panels are the same. Um, the treatment of the edges around the front, the, the edges are a lot crisper, um, same at the back. The nose is a lot lower, so it, it's a lot more ground-hugging than an M1A. Um, and interestingly, people who are aware of the, M, the M1A, they will see a McLaren M1A within the shape. But by the same token, someone who is completely unaware of uh, the 60s will see a modern car. And uh, so we're able to, to basically deliver on what we set out to do, that, that it is a modern take on a, on a classic shape. I had been working for McLaren for about seven or eight years. In, in 1986, uh, John Barnard left to go to Ferrari and I became the chief designer. Um, so I designed the precursor to that car, the MP43, and then um, uh, Ron Dennis, who is the uh, team principal at McLaren, asked me to design the 1988 car, which was the MP44. I was quite fortunate to design that car with a really good team of people, and then in 1988 also I was the race engineer for Ayrton Senna. So I was going to the track as his race engineer and in charge of developing that car through the racing season and helped engineer him to his uh, first world championship. The MP44 has become quite a, a uh, legendary car. Um, during, the 18, during the 1988 season, it uh, finished first 15 out of 16 times, also qualified on the pole 15 times and it finished uh, 10 races, first and second. So regarding results, it's the most successful Formula One car ever. Everybody seems to love that car. Uh, and you see that with the public's uh, response to the N1A as well. Every, everybody just seems to uh, love the shape. Uh, it's a very light vehicle. It weighs about 800 kilos, which is 
the same as maybe a little bit less than a Lotus Elise. Um, and it's got over 500 brake horsepower. So it is, it is very powerful. Um, and the feel that you get behind the wheel, um, you feel everything. So you feel totally in control of the car. I think it's important that when you're the person driving the car, um, you're the one person who can't see the outside. You don't really know what it looks like. So it has to be an experience when you're sat in there behind the wheel. I mean, you're sat as low as it's possible to go, very, very reclined. Um, the road is just above your feet when you look down. Uh, and you've got the big wheel arches either side that you're, you're sort of snugly in between. The car, um, it fits in with uh, what I like, the MP44. It's got a simple elegance. Um, it's a simple looking design, but to accomplish that design simplicity is actually quite, uh, quite difficult. Um, and, and so in relation to the N1A, it's also quite a simple car, an uncluttered car. Um, I mean, it's even uh, carried through into the logo for the car is uh, you know, kind of a simple little diamond with, with my initials in the middle. And those, those initials come from the way I used to sign off all the drawings at, uh, at McLaren. And the, and the N1A is, is based purely on performance, you know. It's, uh, it's not a luxury car, it's not a family saloon or anything. It, it, uh, it, you know, it's the sort of car where performance uh, trumps cup holders and things like that. You know, it, it's all about uh, the performance. And of course, the MP44 was all about performance as well. Uh, but if on a Sunday afternoon, nice day, you want to drive down to the pub and have a nice lunch and a little blast through the countryside, uh, you can do that too. But, you know, realistically, it's not the sort of car that you're going to take to do the weekly shopping. All right, come over, guys. So, what is it that we have in front of us? Well, this is the prototype for the uh, Nichols N1A, and it's a car that's uh, based a little bit on the original McLaren M1A. Uh, the styling is, is similar. Uh, it's a little bit wider and looks a little more ag aggressive, wider tires, wider wheel arches. And uh, we're going to have a bonded aluminium chassis like, like many of the Lotuses here at Bell and Colville have. So it makes a very lightweight, very powerful package which gives you a pretty lively ride. Indeed, it looks pretty striking. Now, as I understand it, this being a prototype, there are obviously a few differences mm. compared with the finished version. Yeah. Um, and I do believe that originally you weren't actually sure if this car was going to go into production at all. That's right, no, it was an idea that we'd had and it was just a question, well, let's build one and see how it turns out. We thought we'd build the prototype and see what the response was uh, and see if people were interested. And has it met your expectations? In some ways, it's even better. I mean, aesthetically, I think it works fantastically well. Um, as Steve said, if you put a, an original McLaren next to it, you'll see, you'll see the similarities, but it is, it is very different in, in detail. Um, but it, yeah, I mean, the, the comments that we get are, are very, very encouraging. And, I can see it. why. In the, this is the first time I've seen it in the flesh, mm. and it is a, an absolutely stunning thing. I've noticed all the people looking as they've driven they past here today. Yeah. It's a wonderful thing to behold. So you've got a nice, big, healthy Chevy engine, basically just over 500 horsepower, yeah. mm -hmm. and then weight just over 800 kilos. So that's yeah. actually lighter than the, than the final Elises that are now being made by some hundred kilos. Yeah. So I imagine it's a bit, a bit lively. Well, the best thing is for you to find out. Take it out and let's, let's see how you get on. I suppose we should really, shouldn't we? <laughs> OK. <laughs>
Uh, the weather's quite changeable this time of the year in England, and um, it has rained. Believe it or not, I filmed everything on the same day, so that glorious sunshine in this morning has gone away. And it's a little bit brisk in here, because one of the things this car does not have is a heater. But it sounds awesome. I've done so many Lotus reviews around here, so I know full well just what the roads are like. The little compressions like that. I mean, this car rides impeccably. You can feel everything. You know what's going on, but it's just so well-rounded. The view out here, this is this is incredible. It's just the most old-school, glorious-looking thing. Now, the choice of engine, Chevrolet LS, might seem lazy to some people, but actually, it's a very common choice for many very good reasons. It's tiny, physically compact that is. It's still reasonable displacement. I think around six liters, might be just under, might be just over. It's also got torque from next to nothing. Those who watch the channel for a bit will know that I really don't like this kind of car being turbocharged because that just blunts the responses. This should be all about the interaction, the driver feedback. And you can tell this thing's fairly responsive. I have been promised to go in that seat at some point in the near future, but as and when that's gonna happen, I, I couldn't say. I have been in or driven quite a few very interesting, rare, unusual, expensive and exotic cars in my time. If you're a shrinking violet, this is not the car for you. Nor is it the car to buy if you're a little bit nervous about looking up at even the lowest of cars. A Lotus Evora towers over the nickels. But that does make it feel incredibly special. My eyes are about level with the top of the tyres on that Range Rover absolutely sensational of course inevitably comparisons are going to be drawn between this and mclaren's modern interpretation of the same thing the elva both are inspired by the same car the m1a bruce mclaren's first car but the new mclaren takes quite a different route it uses a carbon fiber tub like most of their other range it's got a turbocharged v8 engine like most of the rest of the range and it's essentially a 720 or a senna i suppose with the roof lopped off this is an all-new bespoke chassis. It's going to be obviously bespoke chassis again when it goes into production. With your Chevrolet V8, okay, not so exotic, but at a price that's about a seventh of what McLaren will be asking. To me, even if you had the money for the McLaren one, it's just a no-brainer. This just has far more of the spirit of the original in it. Surely, it must do. Look at the thing. Listen to it. I feel so incongruous. Never has a matte black car felt more out of place in the modern world. This thing feels like it's landed from space. We were rigging up the camera earlier, and a little kid came and I looked at you and went, I want to go in the Batmobile. That's what it is, isn't it? It's the Batmobile. Absolutely sensational. And I must admit, I am just champing at the bit to change seats. I've actually sat in the driver's seat at the very least to try it out. Pedals nicely spaced. The gear change still needs some work, so it's still a fairly stiff change, it's a rod, it is going to be cables. And note also, it's GT40 style, so it's right-hand drive car with the gear shifter on the right. And that gear lever itself actually is from one of Ayrton Senna's actual Formula 1 cars. He used that in a practice session, it was taken off the car, gifted to his mechanic as a little keepsake. You've probably noticed that the tyres on this are very low profile. That's one area where it is actually quite a modern looking thing. The originals, all 60s, 70s cars, the big chunky sidewall tyres. There's not so much. And I worried that might give it a sort of bit of a harsh edge. I drove up here this morning in a Bentley Bentayga, which should be the height of luxury. In terms of ride quality, I think this thing matches it. I I'm not joking. Okay, off road, I suspect the Bentley might have it. But otherwise, the Nichols really is marvellous. They're still fine tuning it, but if you told me that this is how the finished thing's gonna ride, I'd be quite happy with it. These dials down here I absolutely love. If for no other reason than I just love proper dials in a car. I hate modern stuff with no temperature gauge or anything like that. I wanna know my pressures, my temperature, everything. Even if I don't pay attention to it that often, it's just nice to look at. Classic Smith's gauges and they're housed in a pod, which is machined from a single piece of billet aluminium. Oh, it does the business, this thing. It really does. Gearbox currently is a five speed. They're still working out whether it's going to be a five or a six in the finished product. The truth is that five ratios is more than enough for something like this because it's got so much torque and so little weight. It can pull long ratios with no trouble whatsoever. the ticket. It's a great 
sensation. And I know Steve is going easy because conditions out there are not ideal. I caught a glimpse of the speedo. I'm not going to tell you what it said, but this thing moves. Oh, and it works with the road so well. This is a proper car. These guys should be very proud of what they've created. The idea that essentially a few lads have got together and managed to come up with something like this, even if it stayed permanently as a one-off, I think it'd be very impressive. But the fact is that I don't know why they are even surprised people would want to buy one of these. My question is, what's your excuse not to buy one? I'm in two minds because I think a car like this should always be exclusive and the fact it doesn't have a roof and it's going to be expensive is probably the natural way of making that happen. But part of me also wants to see them make as many as they possibly can because this thing's awesome. They should be very proud of what they've done. 